my facility uh, is, or my daycare and boarding is, is a lot different than most daycares. Um, it's a lot of free for all most places. Yeah. Um, they do like 30 to 40 dogs, you know, in, in a room. And uh, there's even one place that does up to a hundred dogs. Um, and people get sold on it because they're like, my dog must be doing something all day. And yeah, but it, it's unhealthy in a sense because it's like nonstop. There's never like any regulation to things. And dogs either come home wired and like overstimulated or you know, we got a hundred dogs in a room and a fight breaks out. Like now you got a bunch of dogs coming in right. you know, and it's a bigger problem. So like we do smaller groups here, you know, we structure the day out between duration work to uh, rest time in the kennel to playing. And then there's of course, like the pack walks that we do that it's exercise, but it's structured like relaxed exercise. And now that the fall and winter are coming, you know, we're getting treadmills. So we're gonna start treadmill training the dogs so that they're not, they're still getting that walk, but now it's gonna be redirected to like a different kind of outlet. Um, so that we send them home, you know, tired uh, and like calm. Uh, the way we use the leash, like all my handlers are taught to use the leash a very specific way. Uh, we don't allow, you know, jumping and all that stuff here. Um, so it's, you know, especially with our, our clients who have trained with us, they leave their dogs here and they pick them up and it's like nothing happened, you know, yeah. where a lot of times they leave them somewhere else and the dog goes crazy for a bit because there's no structure and then they get them back and then all of a sudden the dog's like super loopy and stuff. We definitely noticed that when yeah. uh, we dropped her off for boarding the first time. And honestly, since we've been taking her to daycare, we've had no accidents with her. Good. Um, whereas other facilities and stuff, like we we weren't being, we weren't able to have a consistent schedule with her. And just Yeah, because, because they put them on the floor Mm -hmm. and the dogs just pee and poop so when you have a puppy it's a problem like I've had several puppies that I've trained over like 10 years through their like the dog just wasn't getting it so then I'm like sitting and I'm like well everything's right and then I'm like do you take your dog to daycare and they're like yeah I'm like that's the problem because your dog is peeing and pooping whenever it wants and they just mop it up and yeah. then the dog comes home and it's the same exact thing we're here you know it happens but here we take them up to go potty before they do anything uh, so it's maintaining the routine of, you know, not pottying, you know, within the facility as much as possible. So, uh, but I'm glad to hear you're seeing a lot of improvement and uh, we're happy to have her. Um, she she's hasn't gone sick. That's been actually the best part about this whole thing. Because a yeah. lot of time, like, adult, like, she got sick once when she was at daycare, mm -hmm. uh, daycare at um, boarding. boarding. At boarding, yeah. she had a pretty bad DTI. Oh, so wow. It's nice that she hasn't been sick. And happy up. and tired coming home. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that might be because the other thing, you know, so when I started my daycare, you know, I, I've heard so many horror stories from other people taking their dogs to daycare. And I just learned a lot of what not to do. Yeah. Plus, as a trainer and a behavioral trainer at that, like I just have my insight as well. But here we don't do community bowls, right? Or anything like that. Every dog gets their own bowl and their own pail in their kennel. Uh, cause I don't know if you've ever, heard, it's like, um, like dog HPV where they get like the, the lumps and stuff. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. It's super contagious. So like we had a dog who came and, and, and he had it and my handler saw it right away and we had to isolate him and nothing ever happened. Like he, he was kept clear of the dogs. Um, but they were like, well, he only goes to daycare and then the dog park. I'm like, he probably got it at the, you know, at the water bowl, at the dog park, because if, it, if one dog licks it, it's contaminated. And then it's contagious up until I believe the dog is two to three years old. Uh, so, so dogs underneath that age are very prone to getting it. Um, but then after like two to three years, I think they're, they're in the clear. I think it's still possible, very, but very unlikely. Uh, but that's something to keep in mind if you ever take it to a dog park is that you want to be careful with those water bowls or even like the tennis balls, the community balls and stuff. Because as soon as a dog that has that, I forgot what it's called, uh, they put their mouth on it. It's essentially con uh, contagious. Um, and then it takes uh, quite a bit for it to kind of resolve itself. And then once it's gone, like they have to be cleared by a vet and then they can come back to a boarding or daycare facility because most places will not take them because it's so contagious. Okay. We don't really take her to, we never go to a dog park where you have other dogs. Yeah, around. it's only us. Okay. Yeah. Sure. And we bring our own water. <laughs> 
Okay, he came on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, just keep an eye on it. Otherwise, I think she'll be fine. But uh, if if you ever notice any lumps around the mouth and stuff, um, you know, don't get too worried. That's most likely what it is. Uh, you know, it's, it, it takes a little bit to clear up. Uh, I think some vets have been treated by like doing nitrogen or something to like uh, uh, freeze it and then it oh. or something. Um, but I think they only do that if it's really bad or something. So, okay. Um, so Ms. Zoe, you're interested in training now. Yes. Okay. Maybe the big thing for us is her pulling on leash and reactivity to birds, ducks, geese, um, sometimes dogs, but we're seeing improvement with that day by day. So she's starting to look at the dog and not bark or react now. Mm -hmm. um, whereas before she would lunge because she wants to say hi and greet them and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're also, we're also working on being more assertive with people and saying like, oh. our dog's training. Sure. Because everyone's just like, oh, puppy, let, let's, my dog's friendly. It wants to say hi. And it's like, no, we don't want you to say hi. They get offended when you tell them, no, I don't want, I don't. it's like, I'm not, anyways. we're not, we're not here to make friends yet. She needs yes, to that's, you're, you're perfectly fine. I don't worry about that stuff. Um, you're not being rude. Okay. She does both though. When she sees a bird, I yeah, mean, she's full on like, instinct is like bolting focused. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so we have the prey drive essentially, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, which is leading to reactivity. And then you have the you know leash pulling, of course. Uh, anything else with Zoe that you're trying to achieve? Like you know, of course, recall or the common called. Uh, yeah, okay. More consistent recall. Her recall is not that great. Not that great. Um, she has more of the stubbornness when she wants to come, she'll come, but she, it's a high value treat doesn't even work. I guess let's put it that way. I would never feel comfortable having her off. -leash. We would never put her off leash. Sure. Like for sure, she's gonna be running around on the street versus coming home. Yeah. Um, and then, like, if you could have the life that you wanted with Miss Zoe, you know. So, some of my clients is I walk my dog, I go to the dog park, I walk home. Some do that, and then they take the dog to like a restaurant, and then some do all that, and they go hiking, and they take the dog off leash at the beach. You know, they do like a ton of stuff where the dog's gonna be off leash. Where do you find yourselves within that kind of those ranges? I think the latter. I think the yeah. third. The third. Like if the one of the reasons we don't go on walks with her that are long is because it's tiring to take her on a walk because she pulls so much. Yeah. I would love to be able to say, you know what? I'm gonna take her on a walk all the way from here to Lincoln Park. Like I'm making it up, but the same long walks that you guys take them on the pack ones. Yeah. If we could do that and have it pleasant for all three of us, I think we would totally do that yeah. and take her to the beach. I would love to be able to take her to the beach. Okay. And restaurants, like being able to sit without her reacting, just plopping on the floor. That would, so I guess we're asking for a lot, but that would be great. Oh, yeah. So with the way that I train, you know, when I talk to my, my, uh, you know, my consultations, especially like my behavioral ones, you know, where there's like really bad dog reactivity and stuff, usually they're, they're just like, I just want to fix the problem. You know, like, I'm not worried about that stuff. To me, it's not realistic. I just want to fix the problem. And I go, well, with the methods that we use, you know, in most cases, we not only fix the problem, but you get all this other stuff too, okay? And it's really, it's relatively simple to do. It just requires, you know, work uh, and inconsistency. Um, so before, um, uh, like, kind of, did you guys do any research on our website? Do you know my methods? Do you know how I train or approach training? Okay, so you know I use e-collar and prong collar. Okay, so for puppies under six months, I tell people don't even worry about it. You know, so like all my puppy zooms that I have right now, like they're all like we want to learn sit and stuff, and I go, you can learn that on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? What you want to worry about is behavior, right. separation anxiety. You know, uh, preventing aggression issues, reactivity issues, crate training, potty training. That's the stuff that's really hard to get good information on. So like, I'm like, well, focus on that. And then you can go on YouTube and learn how to teach your dog to sit because there's millions of videos on that. Then once we get this done, I'm more than happy to come in and look at like, where are you at with your stuff? And then we'll help you advance it. Um, but then I'll tell them like, 
realistically speaking, you know, if you're using food to train your puppy, it's great foundational work. But once you hit the real world, it goes out the window. Okay. And that's where tools like e collar and prong collar come into play. There are other training tools, like there's like the gentle leader that goes over the face, and there's like the no pull harness, uh, which we use as well. So like we have two puppies here. We have Winnie the Golden, and then we have a new puppy that came in for board and train, Bartolito. So those guys, Winnie's like three months and Bartolito's like two and a half months. They're on the gentle leader, okay? Because I'm not expecting to teach them algebra at this age. It's right. real basic one plus one type stuff, okay? But once a puppy hits six months, that's when you can press them to an adult scale, okay? Mm -hmm. So like I have... I think currently five, six to seventh month old puppies on my calendar that were little tyrants. Like the owners couldn't stand still because the dogs were just like all over the place. We do one class and the dog's sitting right next to them calm. Okay. Because it's about discipline mm -hmm. and it's perfectly safe to use on puppies. Um, you know, dogs bite their puppies. Uh, if, if a puppy gets out of line or like does something to an old adult dog, they just bite them. Right. You know, they there's so in the human world, if you saw a kid get out of line, like you wouldn't spank that kid. That's not your kid. Right. right? But well, at least for me, like I expect I think to myself, like, are you going to discipline this kid? Like, that's how it was when I was growing up. Right. Yeah. But it's not really like that anymore. Uh, so it's kind of the same thing with dogs, but dogs will regulate each other. OK, so like humans, don't we like if something happens, you were supposed to call the police. Right. Unless it's like there's grave danger to you or something, then you're welcome to like defend yourself. In the dog world, if a dog gets out of line, adult or not, or adult or puppy, uh, they correct that dog or puppy, okay? So they, they regulate each other and they use physicality. They bite each other. They don't give each other treats. They don't, you know, give each other CBD to calm down their anxiety. You know, they don't, they don't coo at each other and things like that, okay? Um, and that's how I approach training. And it's not that I'm like against affection and against treats because we use treats. We use it for puppies and I do incorporate it. But when I'm working with, you know, the average dog owner, you know, they got their social life. They maybe they got a family life. They got their work life, the stresses of paying the bills and, you know, trying to make it during a pandemic type crap, right? Is the last thing they want is, has, is, is like developing all these skills that me as a dog trainer need to know. But you as the owner, it's like, you're going to do this for a few weeks and then you're not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, why do you need to know all the concepts? So uh, e-collar and prong collar helps remove a lot of that, like those extra steps or extra things that aren't really necessary. Okay. Um, prong collar, I do very rarely now. It's more so used in conjunction with e-collar. So like I had a young lady who was like 90 pounds and she had 150 pound re dog reactive Great Dane. Okay. So I needed her to have as much leverage as possible in case she turned a corner and was like, oh crap, here's a dog. Okay. Yeah. But most of the time it's purely e-collar. Okay. Uh, the reason is one, it gives you off leash reliability right off the bat. Okay. From day one, regardless if the owners want off these training or not, um, almost always, as long as they're doing their homework, by the third class, their dog is actually capable of progressing towards off leash. Okay. And I'll show them, you know, I'll look, do this and they'll have like a long 30 foot leash and the dog is stuck on their hip. They're like, wow. Right. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, because the method is the same, you know. It's just now you're, you're, you're changing the length of your leash. Now your dog has a 30 foot mistake line, if you will, to uh, get away from you that you can correct to proof your obedience if you want to. If you don't want to keep it on the short leash, it doesn't matter. But I'm just letting you know this is what's cap what you're capable of, okay? So e-collar progresses very quickly with the way that I teach it. Um, everything's at a press of a button, which now is more natural to humans because we have you know our phones, computers, even cars are push start now. Everything's button, 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 okay? So e-collar kind of falls nicely with that way that we kind of just operate. Um, it requires very little technical skill, okay? Um, with the prong collar, people tend to tense up too much and uh, they stay tense. So then the prong is constantly putting pressure 
and they never relax and then it causes frustration with the dogs, okay? Um, the other drawback is like, let's say we're dealing with reactivity and the dog is lunging and barking at another dog and the owner goes to correct them with the prong collar and you can give the dog your harshest correction, but if they're like at a 16 and you can only do a 10, you're never gonna, you're never gonna break that habit because they're just too far gone, right? E-collar allows me to break through all that stuff and we don't have to worry about physical strength because it's the press of a button, okay? So uh, it's, it's fast, it's easy to learn, uh, it's super effective. Um, and it's not because I'm a lazy trainer, because that's like, if you read online, like people say, oh, like, oh, you're lazy. Like you just didn't want to spend the time to teach your dog. I've had people spend $10,000 on several trainers and still have a disobedient dog Yeah, because they all use food and nobody said discipline the dog. And then I come in and then within six classes, the dog's like amazing <laughs> because of discipline, you know? So um, questions so far? No, I think we're both in agreement. I think we're, especially with the pulling, with the reward or the positive reinforcement, we're mm -hmm. getting tired when she pulls because we do stop every single time. Yeah. And we don't get anywhere. And we know yeah. like it takes <laughs> time, but we don't have all the time in the world to, to do that every single time to take her out right. to the bathroom or something. And so, the other thing is it doesn't work. No. Because... <laughs> So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're testing the theory of when your dog is putting pressure on the leash, you stop. And when they ease pressure, you move. Yeah. Yep. So that's too complicated for a dog to learn. Okay. okay. That's, that's a human level thinking. Got okay? it. And I've seen so many people on the streets do that approach. And I'm like, good luck. Cause you're not going to get anywhere. Okay? <laughs> and then what ends up happening is they do give up. And then when they come to me, they're like, yeah, I just didn't stick with it. It's my fault. I'm like, no, it just doesn't work. Okay. The, the, the reason why it's so popular and prevalent is because it makes people feel good to think that they can train their dog using positive only. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> if someone could tell you, you can raise the perfect kid using only positive things and never having to spank them or punish them. Would you believe that? No. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Right. So, but that's how the world is nowadays. So realistically speaking, um, you know, I love positive reinforcement. I use it, I incorporate it, but I don't rely on it <laughs> after a certain point to get me anything near reliable obedience because it just doesn't happen. Okay. Um, Quick question. So because like the obedience sets part, like totally get it and totally agree. I've never actually seen an e-caller personally. Mm -hmm. You probably have. So how does it exactly work out of curiosity? It's a good question. So have you guys ever been to a physical therapist or a chiropractor? Mm -hmm. Yes. Have you had stim? Yeah. Which is one of the, where they do your muscle and they, the pulse pulsating. No, I'll no? show you. Later. That's, fine. Okay. <laughs> That's an e-collar. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So they use it on people. Okay. So most people think it's like a taser. They think it's like sticking your finger in an outlet. Exactly. Uh, it's not. It's electric, but not electricity is how I explain it. Okay. okay. So in my opinion, it's more refined than the human version. In the human version, there's risk of electrocution. Uh, if you have a pacemaker, they can't use it because of uh, the, 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 the electric, electricity, like, you know, uh, uh, catching the sick. Like some, somebody explained it to me. I'm not a physical therapist, but they can't use it on people with physical, with, with, uh, um, pacemakers. Uh, there's also a risk of electrical burn. Okay. Uh -huh. We don't get that with e collar. Okay. The e collars are fully waterproof. Um, <clears throat> depending on the model, she'll need up to a mile range. And I've trained dogs with heart murmurs, dogs that have had seizures, uh, dogs with medical conditions, and no issues. Okay. Because uh, all it is is a centralized muscle contraction. Okay, so there's two. Um, one second, I'm gonna go grab a collar, okay? Cool.
Okay, now she says no. All right. So this one is for smaller dogs, and these are this is meant for a long-haired dog. Those two probes, mm -hmm. they're not that long. They're actually about half the size, but this is for like a <clears throat> a thicker coated dog. Okay, so here, um, let me see. Turn this on. Okay, so I can feel this already. So I can actually feel a little sensation right now. Yeah. Can you see that twitch in my thumb? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the collar. Got it. Okay. So that's 23 out of 127. So you said bigger movement? Yeah. That's 28. Okay. So the higher I go, the stronger the contraction is. Thank you. Um, so with humans, the way that we apply this is very much the same as they do it with humans, is we start low and we work our way up. Okay, so when you had that stem done, they say like, tell us when it becomes too much. Yeah. And they raised it and then you said right there and they lowered it and they're like, how was that? And you said that was fine. And then they let it do its work, mm -hmm. right? Same thing for dogs, okay? Yeah. Now for humans, because it has, to, for humans, they're doing it for like medicinal type purposes, breaking up scar tissue, easing uh, muscle pain, breaking up, oh, or you said a scar tissue, whatever. Uh, but they have to let the machine move your muscle. So that's continuous stimulation. We use momentary. Okay. So only when you press that button does something happen. Okay. And we use what's called pressure work. Have you ever pulled up and pushed down to make Zoe sit? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So that's pressure. That's physical pressure. You pull up, you push down, that creates the sitting motion. The moment she does that, you stop. Right. Mm -hmm. She gets up, you do it again, and you keep repeating that process. So then Zoe learns every time I feel this, if I do this in response, everything goes away. And if I get up, it comes back, but goes away once I go back. Okay. So that's pressure work, but it's physical pressure. Okay. Um, we use e collar pressure. So it looks very much the same. So, like if I pull up and push down and I'm tapping on the remote and I'm contracting her muscle, the moment she sits, it goes away. And then if she gets up, I repeat that process. And then when she sits, it goes away. Okay. So we shape the behavior using the e collar. Most people and most trainers still use more punishment based which means if they say sit and the dog doesn't reply, I'm sorry, uh, uh, comply, um, your dog shouldn't reply because they can't talk. But <laughs> if, if they don't comply, they punish them, okay? So they'll say sit, the dog doesn't do it, boom, right? right. So for me, I, I hate that because it's they're too far apart. The dog does it, so like for me growing up, if my mom said, do the dishes, and then two hours later, I didn't do the dishes. And she's like, hey, I told you to do the dishes. And I got spanked for it. I could relate that to not doing the dishes. Dogs don't do that. Right. It's too far apart. Mm -hmm. So we use the pressure to shape everything. We shape the heel, the sit, the down, the come, the place, and the stay. We shape everything through pressure. Okay. So if Zoe were to forget to sit on the heel and I tapped her, she'd just go like this. Oh, I forgot. Right, she un she has a concept of why it happened, and it's not like what the crap was that for, right. okay? Um, and that's what builds the reliability of it, okay? Is that something uh, she always has to wear, or just during the first six weeks or whatever that she has to wear an e-collar, and then you don't need the e-collar anymore after all? Uh, so, in my opinion, when you need it, you have it, okay? So, if she's a great dog in the home, you don't mm -hmm. need it, but if she's on a walk, you most likely need it. Okay. okay. And the reason that is, is you guys drive? Yes. Yeah. You go on the expressway? Yes. You go the speed limit? No. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> That's usually how it works. Okay. And you get mad. Or, and I don't go the speed limit either. Okay. So, you know, not to put you on the spot. Most people don't. Right. And then when you see someone going the speed limit and you're stuck behind them, you're mad. Right. But they're technically doing the right thing. Yeah. 
according to the law, right? Now, if you see a squad car, what happens? You slow down. Yeah. Low speed limit all of a sudden, right? Now, we as humans know better, but we still play with that boundary, right? When we can, because we know there's no consequence. Mm -hmm. So think of the e-collar as a cop on the collar, if you will, okay? When she's got it on, she's going to behave herself. She knows there's threat of consequence, so on and so forth. But it's not that you're always using it. Mm -hmm. It's just that the presence of it alters her behavior. Before okay. you, even after a dog has proven to be reliable, you still keep the e-collar on them? Yes, because you can't account for life. Okay. So like I had a client's dog. Uh, she was at Travis Park in Lincoln, Lincoln Park. And her dog has super crazy prey drive and was playing with other dogs. And a rabbit ran through. Right. And she had to max out the collar and continuous it, which is the harshest correction that you can do because she was about to run into the street, okay? Because at that moment, the dog was so in like, because it's, you know, squirrel, boom, yeah. right? That she had to just kick in with it and they're like, this is an emergency. Same dog was at Oz Park and uh, there was somebody threw a ball and her dog and another dog went after the ball at the same time, dog fight. And she just jacked it up and remoted and her dog 180 out of the fight, no problem, okay? had another client in Lincoln Park was walking his dog off leash and like turned to check on his dog and saw his dog nose to nose with a coyote and then recall, right? But his dog 180, he didn't have to go into emergency mode, but he was like, Jesse, it was great to see my dog respond like, like without hesitation, but also it felt good to know if there was an issue, I was going to have the capacity to make him back or make him come back. Had another client, uh, at the park, um, somebody sent off a random firework. All the dogs start to scatter because they're scared of fireworks. They're able to get their dog back because remote, right? So in those situations, it's not about obedience. It's not controlled context. It's just shit, something happened. Yeah. And my dog flipped out, freaked out, kicked in the drive. And uh, I had the means of making them comply. Because mm -hmm. the biggest thing would be flight mode. You know, if there's a big loud crash or firework and she spooks and she runs for it and you call her, she's not being disobedient. She's running for her life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know that's a firework, right? right? So then technically in that moment, it's making the dog more afraid of running from you than they are running from the sound. Right. Okay. So that's where it comes in. And then for me personally, uh, I was walking with my two dogs um, through the boulevard here in Logan Square, and this happened to me twice. And one was in August, and then the other, I think, in September. Um, and two times, someone randomly blew up a firework. And my pit hates fireworks. She gets super anxious. She doesn't like it. She wants to go and just run. And I'm and I didn't have my e collar. You know, because I'm not expecting someone to let off a firework and I'm like, I wasn't gonna planning on letting my dogs off leash. And I'm just like sitting there like two miles away from home going, crap, like now I got to deal with this on the way back. I wish I would have had my collar because then I could have just calmed her down right away, you know? So that's why it's present in my opinion. Have I had people in the past move beyond the e-collar? Yes. Um, but when they've told me about it as if it was some kind of accomplishment in my head, I'm just like, but what if there's an emergency? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the, that's the main thing. So, um, so it's nothing good or bad. It's just the way of the world. Yeah. Um, you know, and then she is a living, breathing creature. Uh, she can make her own decisions and, you know, we're all opportunistic. So at some point, what ends up happening is the obedience will start to digress because you're not, re you're not able to reinforce it if needed to the degree that it was taught. And then she learns that now most people's standard for obedience is much easier than mine mine is there is no hesitation you do what i say immediately because i need reliability um because the last thing i want is someone to say jesse my dog took off after the street and i called them and they didn't come back yeah okay so that's how i think um and i hope it never happens to you i hope it never happens to any of my clients but truth be told it happens at least like so far this year i've had at least five to eight stories of like some kind of crazy scenario happening and the owner having to max out the collar in order to make the dog comply. So, okay. Um, questions about that.
No, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Good. Um, let me think here. Any any questions? No. No. Good. Um, it's good because you guys have the same line of thinking. That's yeah. usually what I have. To, what I struggle with. <laughs> Okay, is uh, there's a the, uh, research and just yeah. make sure we're educated on no, it's good, it's good, I love it. So, what dictates the length of time and the cost, and you have options with Zoe, um, is you know, we have our daycare and train program, and I know she's in the middle of a bundle and stuff. And you can always, if you decide to do that, you know, you can always put the bundle on hold. We had another client do that because uh, we, we had it's written in the contract where it's like, oh, like you have to use your days within so much time. But because of COVID and things slowed down, I was like, I'm not worried about it. Bring your dog in. And then once you're done with your program, you can just pick up with your bundle. It's no big deal. Okay. Uh, but, but because Zoe is, in my opinion, pretty straightforward and it's just obedience. I mean, I know you have the prey drive and stuff, but what I've seen from her and everything, I don't foresee that as being an issue that you're going to struggle with. Okay. Um, is the pros and cons would be with the daycare and train, you know, the training is associated to us and then we transfer it to you. Okay. So there's still always work to be done, except the bulk of the work has been done and you're just kind of working on, okay, Zoe, uh, when, when we say heal, it's like when Jesse and his staff say heal. Okay. And then we just transfer all that toward, uh, to you. Uh, and we get what you would get done, like, uh, for example, let's say a six week program, what would take you six weeks, we get done in two weeks. Okay. Um, so one week here is like three weeks at home is how mathematically how that would work. Okay. Cause for my in-person programs, I have three, six, nine, and 12 week programs. Okay. You're in the range of six to 12. Uh, the three-week program is more so for people whose dogs struggle with leash reactivity, and that's the only thing they care about, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, the other programs are for, we cover more ground, okay? So for the six-week program, that's the, I walk my dog to the dog park, my dog is only off-leash at the dog park, and I call my dog back, and then we walk back home. Uh, the nine-week program is, you know, that plus I take my dog to a restaurant, and my dog doesn't move for a period of time. And then the 12-week program is we hike with our dog, our dog goes to the beach, we go to the restaurant patio, we go to the dog park, we do a lot of stuff with our dog, okay? So that's the full control, where we teach all the commands and we build them up to off-leash reliability, okay? Uh, in daycare and train terms, the 10-day would be the walk my dog to the dog park and then, you know, walk them home, the 15 uh, day or three week would be the walk my dog dog park go to a restaurant and then the 20 day program is the hiking beach restaurant and all that other stuff okay um with the daycare and train program after she's had five days with us then you can schedule your first visit so that we start transferring things to you okay so for those first five days because you don't know anything yet expect her to not like act like she doesn't know anything Okay, because we have to transfer it to you. Once you've had that first class, and what we've been doing now that we started because of COVID was we, we record the first session of every new behavior we teach. Okay, so you see how she learns the behavior. And then at the end of the five days, we send you what we call the explanatory sessions. And so you see how Zoe responded to the e caller because every dog's different. You see what Zoe's specific numbers are to her and how she learned. And then some of our clients will kind of hold off on the in-person sessions and they'll watch the video because you're, you're, they're essentially teaching you in the video mm -hmm. and they'll do that, right? And they'll use the videos. And then after they're done with the videos and there's like things that they don't understand or things that they're struggling with or maybe something that didn't fully transfer, then they use the in-person sessions so that we close that gap, okay? And others are very like, after every five days, they like to just have their session. So it's all like, you know, just personal preference. Uh, so that's one way about it. Uh, with the in-person sessions, um, I'm teaching you to teach Zoe, okay? So I'm there with you in person uh, and I'm coaching you through everything from ground zero, okay? 
So the pro of a daycare train is we get it done quicker. Yeah. Uh, the con is it's tied to us and now we got to transfer it. Um, the pro of an in-person training session is you're learning everything from the get-go. You're doing all the work. Uh, so nothing is tied to us. Uh, the con is it takes longer. Okay. Uh, the other thing you have to account for is just the weather is changing now. Um, so it's going to get colder. Now I do train rain, sleet, or snow. Um, but I tell people, now we've been telling people like, do keep your dog in mind. Like I have a couple of dogs that we trained outside and they just, it was too cold for them. And you know, it's just a bear. I mean, yeah, I was going to say for Zoe, she's probably going to be fine. Um, but that's just something else to think about, you know, that, um, you know, we work outside. We also have my facility, you know, where we can use as well, where it's still in person. Um, but just so you have a, you know, a heads up of, in terms of the difference of what each program would, would, would get you and all that. Okay. I had a quick question related to that. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend? Because there's one thing that comes to mind. We're going to be driving to California first week of December. Okay. And so there are a couple of things. Well, obviously there's a time frame of between now and first week of December of like, that's pretty much the time we have. Yeah. The second part of what are the potential pitfalls you see in a road trip that we need to account for to make sure she behaves well because it's sure. a long road trip how is she in the car in general she loves she it. loves the she car falls asleep yeah in the back. okay but it's a long trip right? it's like three and a half days and then you get to a new environment she's not familiar with sure so that I, dog, by the way the other environment is at her like for two weeks we'll be at her parents' place yeah. and they have a small dog that is not very dog friendly. But like, what we're doing is we're staying somewhere else for two weeks, introducing them on a walk together, yeah. slowly reintroducing them, not like automatically staying at somebody's house with a dog. Gotcha. Um, so for the road trip, I don't anticipate that you would have issues. Okay. Uh, what I would suggest is that you bring a mix of things like a Kong with like some peanut butter, um, uh, an antler. You'd be surprised. She does not like peanut butter. Like, go figure. <laughs> She's like the worst when it comes to food. But anyway, sure. Uh, maybe cheese whiz or something. Uh, you know, anything you fill it. So it's just like different things that if she starts to get like a little antsy, yeah, you can give her something uh, so that it keeps her preoccupied. Um, because typically, when dogs have issues in the car, like there's already issues in the car. Okay, so the only thing that I would see is that she could get a little just kind of tiresome, but yeah. dogs sleep 16 to 20 hours a day as is. So a road trip shouldn't be a problem for her. And if you've started your training by that point, if she was like misbehaving, you can also, you would have the ability to correct it. Okay. So I, I don't think that's gonna be a problem for you in regards to the dog and the socialization thing. Um, the walking is a great idea. That's what I do with the dogs here. That's what we do with the dogs that are, uh, anti-social that are training with me and their owners want to learn how to like help them make friends and we have videos on our youtube channel that you're more than welcome to use as a reference to get an idea of like how it works okay. um, it is a bit of a process but walking my opinion is the, is the best way to build a bond between two dogs and even between a dog and a human okay uh the, the good thing is you know if you started training you know with a dog that's not so friendly uh if you like took Zoe and she was unregulated and she's like, dog, and I want to play with you. We're going to be friends. Be that's like, going to be a problem. Yeah. That's yeah. how she would be right now. If we didn't do training pretty much. She yeah. Was, Charlie, so, would be like, Oh puppy, let me, or not puppy, but whatever. Yeah. yeah. So with the e-call, you'd be able to correct her and set boundaries so she can respect that dog space. And then at minimum, I always just, uh, I care about coexistence. They don't need to love each other or, you know, be best friends, but I don't want her antagonizing the dog and starting anything. And I don't want that dog seeking Zoe and trying like to bully her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, other questions. And from a new environment standpoint, like you don't think that could alter her uh, behavior that we would have like taken time training. Gotcha. So, does that make sense? Uh, do you mean more so just like uh, in regards to her reliability of her obedience within that new context? Or yeah. are you talking about like we're in a new environment and separation anxiety? No, like we would have done the training, right? And then she would be obedient at the end of the training. But now we're taking her to a new environment. Oh, yeah. Does that training still allow us to control her in a new environment? Or is the new environment yes. resetting her mind pretty much? So it's kind of like a reset, but it's very easy to get her back into place. Okay. Um, it all comes down to the number. 
Okay. So like, let's say when you work, uh, let's say we work at my facility and her number is like 25 and my caller goes to 127 to give you a range. Uh, cheaper callers go to 10, 10 and 127 are the same, but I have 117 more divisions. So that's, okay. I mean, that's way better. Yeah. Yeah. So we can really fine tune it to the dog. Um, so like, let's say it's 25 here and then you go to the dog park or something and it's 40 there because there's more stuff going on. And then you drive to, it was the California, you said? It's a long drive. Um, (laughs) You drive to California and totally new environment, right? Maybe it's 65. Yeah. Right. So you're just having to, so once she learns the concepts, it's not that they forget them. It's just, is the obedience important enough for her to do within the new context? And you simply achieve that through power. Okay. Okay. And that's the most common thing that people struggle with is their dog would be great in one setting and they get so stuck on like my dog works on 12 because it makes them feel better to think that their dog's at 10% of the power, but then they're complaining because their dog doesn't listen in another environment. And I'm like, well, are you raising your number? And they go, no, I'm at 12 because 12 always works over here. I'm like, yeah, but you're not over here. You're over there. It's a different number. Okay. Okay. So e-caller once you get used to it and adapting to it like and we i always tell everybody don't get married to a number it's going to change um and then you'll look at zoe and you'll tap her and then you'll know right off the bat like okay yeah it's not enough and you'll just bump it to the appropriate number and then all of a sudden boom there she is okay so shouldn't be a problem and i always encourage people in the beginning to practice their training in, in all sorts of contexts right off the bat you know, because you're right off, right then, you're just like building the reliability no matter what the context is. Yeah. People tend to get stuck in a specific area and then they do that for like months and then they decide to go on a trip with their dog and then they go and they're like, oh, the dog was terrible. Right. I'm like, well, did you ever break out of that bubble? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, then that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. okay. That makes a lot of sense. So you're basically adjusting the e collar based on stimulus. Like, what's Correct. Your- okay. Correct. Right. So like, it's like, let's say, you know, she's got really good prey drive. Like I, we've not, I don't think we've seen her prey drive here. I'd have to ask my, my employees. Um, Cause in pack box, it seems like she's super calm and, and she just yeah. happy, like, and wants to up. keep up with yeah. everyone. Cause <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the walks are very structured. So we typically don't see reactivity, even dog reactivity. Some of the dogs we have are dog reactive and they're fine. Right. Uh, because of that structure. So um it's possible that she has crazy prey drive and we've not seen it yet um and you might find when like so i get dogs that are very sweet right and then seemingly soft to the owner Mm -hmm. and then they see a squirrel and the owner will be on 80 out of 127 and they're like just like you see their heart just like wrenching like oh my god i'm at 80 i'm like yeah but look at your dog like they're staring at the squirrel (laughs) <laughs> and nothing's happening, you know, because it's not enough to disengage the brain. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I just keep going up and then I'm at 105 and all of a sudden I was like, oh, what? Because it needed that much to override their prey drive. Okay. Because there's, there's a couple of factors. There's the physical, dogs are physically resilient as is because they bite each other. Okay. So they have a higher tolerance for discomfort or pain. So that's one factor. And then you have the state of, 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 of the mental state. Are they zoned in on something? And then you have emotional distress. So if I get a dog that's physically tough and has a lot of anxiety, I anticipate we're probably going to have a higher number because I have to override two things. You see that? If I have a soft dog physically, but they just zone in a lot, then I'm like kind of in the middle. Like they kind of balance out somehow. And then once you start working with it, it's going to make a lot of sense. It's it's pretty logical. Uh, it's just that people get too wrapped up emotionally in things, and that's what holds them back most of the time. Okay. Um, other questions? Those were the main ones. But now that, I mean, everything makes sense. Thanks for the details. Good. Um, yeah, I've been doing this for 10 years, so I'm pretty, I, I know, like, the, 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 like the standard, how do you say, the questions that people have and the concerns. But like I said, you guys, like kind of already have that, you're like understanding already, so it just makes it easier. Uh, your brains kind of work the same way. Um, Cause I get a lot of clients whose brains don't work that way, you know, and then it's, it's a problem, you know? Um, so 
you have a couple of choices. Um, I don't care what you do. Like, and like, let's say, cause you have a short time frame, and you're going to, to California is you could do like the daycare and train, and, you know, do your trip or whatever. Uh, you could do a 12 week and then do six classes, go on your trip to California, practice some stuff out there, enjoy the weather, come back and say, Hey, Jesse, uh, everything was great, but we noticed these are her weaknesses. And then for the second half of the program, we just start to target like those things and kind of adjust the training. Um, so, you know, that's perfectly fine. Uh, gaps in training don't matter with the way that I train. Okay. okay. Some of my clients have a rotating schedule and I'll see them one week and then I won't see them for two weeks. And if anything, I tell them, it just gives you more time to practice, you know? So you you learn even more information about your dog in that time frame. You make more mistakes and you, you learn what needs to be corrected. Uh, so time is, is, is great. Um, it just comes down to, you know, uh, how well trained you want her to be and then how much time you're willing to commit to it and whether or not you want to be, you know, out, in the winter months actually training with zoe and all that stuff okay yeah how much homework i guess for us it, do you normally see like for clients like is it an hour a day or is it even just every time you take her out it's when it is as you live your life with zoe okay so every walk that you go on you would just apply your training then Okay. You know, so if you do three 20 minute walks and go, then you do your three 20 minute training sessions. Okay. okay. Um, so that's what's great about e collar And what, what matters the most is consistency, not time. Okay. Okay. If every time you walk Zoe, even if it's only for like 20 minutes a day, but you're always strict about how you walk her, that's what matters. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I, I was telling another consult earlier today, I was like, I'm the lazy man's dog trainer. Um, because I understand people have shit to do, you yeah. know, and, um, the reason why I'm, I'm at like this stage of, of my career and I use this tool is when I used to volunteer at humane societies, dogs were being returned for the most mundane of reasons. Would it be potty trained, pulled too much on the leash? Would it quiet down from barking? Right. And, and unfortunately, if no one adopts those dogs, they get put down, yeah. right? So, you know, I developed my program going, I know people have lives and I want to get effective training as efficient as possible. And e collar is a tool that allows me to do that. And when you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, we would love to walk her more, but it's unpleasant, is once you get the control in, and you're like, holy crap, this is so easy. Um, it's effective. We're able to just walk her now within a couple of days. You're going to start doing a lot more with Zoe. And the 606 is right behind our house. We can yeah. almost see it, right? So oh, yeah. Us, sure, you have that nice little trail. Yeah, perfect, right? It's just there are so many distractions on the 606. That it's not fun right now. Yeah, no. And, and that's a great place to, to work. And, and that's what we train for. I yeah. want you to have Zoe and be able to take her anywhere. Okay. And this is within the week. Yeah. We're not talking, you know, I'm not saying like two years, you'll have your dog. No, within a week, it's like, boom, we're making that progress, but you do have to do the homework. Okay. And it's simply just train anytime you walk her, take those 20 minute walks and reinforce the training. And as long as you're consistent, you're going to make that progress. Okay. Uh, other things. So typically within the sessions, Think of the session as we're teaching the concept to the dog. And I'll tell you, like, you know, if you each do a three, five, three to five minute session, that's all you need to do. Okay. And then I say, just up to start applying it. So like the place command, uh, you, you probably see on our life story, like we'll have dogs on the, on the placemats. Once we teach a dog place on the first day, they're doing two to three hours wow. on the first day. Now they make mistakes, right? but we're already pushing them to that degree because it's very simple. Okay. It's just a matter of, you know, when can I do this with Zoe? Well, I'm like, if you're going to watch Netflix for an hour and a half, do it then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're going to be working from home at your computer, do it then. Cause you're not going to be moving. Right. Right. So I, I just think of ways of how we take the obedience that you've learned and how do you start applying it to life? So you're actually just training as you live your life with Zoe 
And then once you get the reliability and she un fully understands the concepts, then it's not so much training. It's just your, your uh, it's application. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's super important because a lot of times people learn the skills and don't apply them. And then fast forward a couple of months, like, oh crap, I'm having guests come over. I want my dog to not move for three hours. I'm like, well, good luck. Yeah. Cause you should have been doing that for the last couple of months when there was nothing going on. Now you have guests coming over, you know? So, um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. In terms of the e-collar, how much does Zoe weigh? 49, 49 pounds. pounds. Okay, and how, how big are we expecting her to get? Uh, they said 75 Three. to okay. 80. <laughs> okay, how old is she now? Six months. She's six months, okay, yeah, so she's got room to grow. Um, so Man. the collar. Thanks a lot. So <laughs> at six months, technically, um, dogs tend to hit their height okay really? yes that's 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 typically a good high yeah. i like it okay thank you that's so, good news. <laughs> but <laughs> of course you have to have a butt thanks because yeah. when because i see like looking at her like uh at six months they tend to hit their height and then they fill out so then i wouldn't expect her to get like maybe 55 60 if she stays her height okay so it's All like right. the teenager body at six months to a year and a year to two months is adult body okay, okay. now it's possible that she may have another growth spurt yeah uh, and then you're going to get that 70 to 80 pound dog okay okay um but in my experience unless it's a large breed dog like a great dane or a german shepherd you know something like that um because they can have delayed growth spurts uh it's usually they hit their height at six months and then they fill out okay I had a quick question actually before the e collar because that's something that we forgot to mention to you is Jess ultimately would like to get Zoe approved as a oh therapy. As therapy. How did you guess as a therapy dog? Yes. So right. is, oh, go ahead. Um, so therapy dog tests are stupid simple. <laughs> People fail them all the time. Okay. Because the methods don't work. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you this right now. If you take her to the, to the test, or when you take her to the test, you cannot t tell them that you trained her with e-collar, prong collar, or any kind of aversive tool, okay? After you get your certification, doesn't matter, okay? I have plenty of dogs that I've trained on. So I've had dogs that failed the test so many times, did a program with me, passed it, okay? And what their owners did is when they showed up, they went a couple of blocks away, they did a quick little test run to warm their dog up, and then took them to the test. Pass, <laughs> good to go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that's perfect. I have another dog right now that's training for therapy dog as well. No, my friend, my friend did the same thing. So, yeah. so it's perfectly fine. You just can't let them know. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, let me think here. Oh, for the e-collar, um, what I would suggest is you get the one that's appropriate for her size in case she grows to a 70 to 80 pound dog. Okay. 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 Um, it's just like a, a, it's a newer model. So the one that they used to have before they recently discontinued, uh, and they replaced it with a, a different model and Maria would send you this information. I believe it's two ninety nine with ta without tax. So you're looking probably like at a three ten to three twenty ish range. Um, I believe it's a one mile range, fully water. It's fully waterproof. I believe it's a one mile range system. Um, but it's, it's meant for those larger breed dogs. Okay. okay. So regardless, if she doesn't grow to be that big, it just means sensitivity wise, her number would be lower. Okay. But if she gets bigger, no problem. We have the power to compensate just in case. Okay. okay. Um, and in terms of length of time and which program, it really just comes down to personal preference. Again, if you do daycare and train, you still have to do work. It's just a chunk of it's already been done. Um, and we start to transfer everything to you. Um, and you can book those in-person sessions as soon as after five days, okay? Because we want to make sure that she's covered everything. And then right off the bat, we have enough to like teach you and you can start applying. Um, with the in-person, uh, the pro is you're learning it. The con is it's going to take longer because uh, you're having to take those weeks in between to train her on a skill at a time, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, the first thing we teach is always heal. 
um, cause that's the best command to teach a dog because it helps them learn how to turn pressure on and off. It also helps alleviate any stress that the dog may build up in response to the e-collar. It's all normal. And then I try to jump into recall or come and call as soon as possible. Cause come and call tends to take people the longest to teach because it requires you to go somewhere where you have space to practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Heal is like the fastest thing people learn because you walk your dog at least three times a day. Okay. And then everything else is as we go along. Um, uh, and her progress really comes down to how much are you actually committing to the training? So technically, you know, there's not a ton of homework. Um, but if you're actively applying and rehearsing things, you're obviously going to have a much faster progress uh, as opposed to doing the bare minimum. Like you'll get there, but it's just going to be a longer term. Okay. And Maria can send you the pricing for these things. And then she'll send you, uh, you might need a training form, like a training contract, because uh, I think you just have a boarding or daycare contract with us. So she'd cover all that stuff with you. And then she'd handle the scheduling and, and you know, whether or not you want to do the daycare or train versus the um, in-person. Okay. Oh. Um, anything else? No. Okay. Well, it was a pleasure formally or, or you know, virtually uh, meeting you guys. I think we've seen each other in passing. Um, we appreciate you supporting our business. Uh, Zoe's great. We love having her here. And then if you have any concerns or just like curious of how the e-collar works, feel free to go to our YouTube channel. Uh, lesson ones are always the greatest or the best to learn because no one knows what they're doing but me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and you see how the dog progresses within the lesson and it's just how it works. Um, I also have more in-depth videos uh, in a playlist called dog training slash client highlights. And that's where I go. Like I take cases uh, like behavioral cases and I kind of chop them up and I talk about them in the e-collar and how it works. Um, so it's more of a shorter 15 minute like synopsis as opposed to a one hour video. Um, you know, so if you want to understand more about e-collar. Um, otherwise, it was a pleasure meeting everybody. And if you have any questions, you just let us know. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Thanks a lot. Thank you so awesome. much. You enjoy the rest of your evening and then uh, we'll see you sometime in the week. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Bye. Thank you guys. Take care. You too.